Hey everyone, it's your pal Pius Bird here, bringing you an interview with Ariadne Conil, my friend and a member of the Alpine Linux Project, who has had a long and wide-ranging career in open-source software. She's done just about everything from Debian to ActivityPub to IRC to... Now she apparently helps secure Curl Bar Bash. Enjoy. In charge of Alpine, I sit on the technical steering committee and I plan to leave the technical steering committee um, after the 3.17 release because I have other projects in development that are taking up a lot of my time. Well, you were an early supporter, booster, and you wrote APK or contributed heavily to it, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, most of APK tools was written by... Timo Taras, but I do have a significant amount of code in it. So today I just wanted to interview because we've known each other in some form or other for several bajillion years. I believe we've met in Debian when you yelled at me about my Lenten warnings. <laughs> that sounds like something I would have done, yeah. <laughs> So I just wanted to, like, catch up, and also, it seemed like an interesting topic for a video stream slash vodcast slash whatever, so... <laughs> what are you doing currently? Like, what are you excited about? These days, I'm a principal engineer at a free software consulting company called ChainGuard. We do a whole bunch of quote-unquote software supply chain security consulting for people who are ingesting free software, and so we help them to ingest the, the free software efficiently and make sure that they are mitigating any sort of risks in terms of, you know, downloading random software off the internet and, you know, curl, pipe, bash type stuff. We try to shut all of that down and make sure that people are ingesting free software in a way that's they understand what they're ingesting and they aren't, you know, accepting licenses like the SSPL that they might not want to accept. I may seem like the village idiot here, but what's the SSPL? The SSPL is a um, variant of the AGPL that is really aggressive. And basically, MongoDB, they got pissed off at Amazon. And so they made this license and relicensed the MongoDB under it, the SSPL. And basically what the SSPL does is if you offer a service based on anything under SSPL, you have to release all of your source code relating to that service, like the billing code, the code to like spin up new instances of the software and all of that stuff. So, you know, they, they argue that it is a more extreme form of network copyleft than AGPL, but personally, uh, a lot of people, including myself and in the free software community, feel like it's more of a shakedown than anything to do with <laughs> software freedom, so... Yeah, personally, I always distrust a license offered by one company. <laughs> like, like, and, that, and, and that's the thing, like, with the, the SSPL model, it's basically like, okay, the community version is SSPL, and the... But, but if you don't like that SSPL, we can sell you a license for, you know... <laughs> yeah, uh, nice, servi ni nice service you got there. Be shame if something happened to it. <laughs> right, exactly. So, none of this is really about software freedom. It's about revenue. And so, that that's basically what we do, is we try to help companies make sh to ensure that they are understanding what they're ingesting and understanding like what exposures and responsibilities they have and making sure that you know all of the compliance things are met and all of that so cool now how do you shut down curl bar bash because that seems to be proliferating and like there used to be a tumblr account that 
named and shamed those kinds of patterns, but the author gave it up as there are just too many of them and it got boring after a while. Right. So, one of the things that we have is, I mean, we mostly work in, like, the area of, like, Kubernetes, you know, deployment. So, like, curl pipe bash isn't really a huge thing there, but there is, like, a, we, we've created a system called SigStore, which is free software. It's sponsored in part by the Linux Foundation and all of the companies that pay into that. And I'm sure some of our viewers uh, probably have negative opinions on the Linux Foundation, and some probably have happy opinions on the Linux Foundation, but beside the point, it, it's basically what SigStore does is you know how like packages are signed in Linux distributions like Debian signs everything with GPG and you know APK signs everything using X509 RSA signatures and all of that. Well, SigStore lets you sign anything with an X509 RSA signature that is mapped to an ephemeral key and that ephemeral key is authenticated using an OpenID connect identity. So if you have like a GitHub account or a Twitter account or a Mastodon account or whatever, you can use that as proof of identity and get the uh, SigStore CA called Fulcio to uh, sign it for you. And so if you do that, then you can secure your curl pipe bash scripts by using a tool that we released called sgit which is wrapper around wgit that uh, checks to see if the thing being downloaded has been signed and the signature for the transparency log. And so. So you, so you basically combined ideas from Let's Encrypt to secure the curl bar. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we we secure a lot of other stuff with SigStore, but that is an application that is actively being supported. sounds awesome now one of my viewer one of my early view beta viewers when i mentioned i was doing this wanted me to and i don't know a good segue to this so wanted me to include include a question on she doesn't know why alpine is so different and it's like i was telling her it was a different c library and it's like and she's like, what the heck does that mean? So can we talk Alpine for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> so Alpine, I mean, being a GNU Linux distribution really wasn't a goal of Alpine. The goal of Alpine was to create something that was small and efficient and usable for software appliances. And it's designed for developers who don't care about like compatibility with the GNU. Uh, ecosystem so much. They just want something that is minimalist and that they can deploy and maintain quickly. And a lot of a lot of the work that I do on a daily basis is creating tools to enable maintenance of entire fleets of like Alpine systems and other things like that. But the the point behind using different software components, for example, BusyBox, we can pack, you know, 500, 600 different applications into a single binary, and that saves a lot of space, and it's a single thing where we can, like, you know, fix the CVE in BusyBox, and then it'll fix, like, dozens of the applications in BusyBox at once, instead of having to go and patch like 30 different packages to fix the same CD. So that's part of it. And then also because BusyBox lets you cram like 600 apps into a single binary and have it be small. Um, since Alpine is targeted at small systems and containers and things like that, um, like if you're running from RAM and you have like, you know, 128 megs of RAM, you don't want to like give up like 20 to 25 megs of RAM just to have GNU on your system when BusyBox is good enough, right? Like, that makes sense. I hope. I enjoy Alpine because I can just throw it on a VM and forget it exists until the, 
until the VM host in the background crashes. <laughs> yeah, so basically the the goal was to create a small and resilient system and compatibility wasn't the goal. So when you're not really thinking about compatibility, that gives you the freedom to think about like, okay, so if we're starting over from scratch, what, what kind components of decision? can we use? What, com what components can we use to increase the resiliency of, of like a VM host or a container or whatever? Um, and so that originally led to us using GR security because, you know, with the PAX uh, kernel patch, that caught and mitigated a lot of like exploitation attempts and things like that so that you could literally just set it and forget it. But the thing about using PAX is if you use software that isn't aware of PAX and it has things like just-in-time compiling going on, then that's going to also get caught by PAX. So, you know, we already had broken compatibility for GR security because of the benefits that the PAX patch had. Unfortunately, GR security has gone private, and so we don't ship GR security anymore. But the whole point is that we have this defense in depth approach so you know you have these appliances that you deploy up there and you set them and forget them right like you said so you know gr security was like the first layer defense and then musil with its hardened malloc uh is another layer defense and then you know uh our implementation of fortify on top of uh, Musil was a layer defense and patching GCC to compile position independent execution uh, executables by default was a layer defense and basically all of these things layer on top of each other to create something where you can just confidently set up like an Alpine machine to do whatever and be confident that it'll still be running like five years later even though you haven't done anything to it now i'm not saying that you should you shouldn't patch obviously you should patch but the point is that you when you want these deployments to last for years without having to mess with them you have to design a system that is resilient even if you don't patch and so that's where all of these decisions came from was how can we make an OS that okay we know people aren't going to patch this thing even though they should how can we ensure that they don't get compromised even if they don't necessarily have the greatest patch hygiene or when you sometimes can't like like exactly like early on in my career I deployed I helped deploy uh, boxes containing Ubuntu 12.04 that are still in service, I happen to know. <laughs> and probably the company I was helping or under the table for Applebee's gift cards, <laughs> I was basically helping my dad's company do this. and. They're no longer in that line of business, and my dad is no longer at the company, so no one is watching those particular boxes. <laughs> and I wish I had... Well, exactly. <laughs> yep. And, and, I mean, I, as an example, like, you know, when you go to, like, McDonald's or something, and you see, like, the list of burgers and things that you can buy on the TV screen, right? The digital signage, they call it. Yep. There's a lot of Alpine boxes running those digital signs. Like, when you're driving down the highway and you see, like, a digital billboard, that usually is running Alpine because they can't go and patch all of these things. There are... A few years ago, I worked for um, a research group 
and the national laboratories and what they were doing were building these sensors that um, would measure like CO2 level and particulate matter level and you know all of these things related to pollution and these are little raspberry pi things that were built by hand and they have like a little cellular modem plugged into them and you know we can't go and patch all of those things and there's thousands of them out there and like to patch them would mean to go out to like some meadow out in the middle of nowhere and you know load a new os on it and so that's what i mean when i say like alpine was really designed for building things that last very long periods of time and can't just be like necessarily maintained in the way that you would maintain a traditional machine so although it has desktop available it's not really designed for that sort of thing and we should all move back to slackware if we <laughs> well i mean you can obviously we have desktop available but the, the point of the desktop in Alpine is really so that you can boot into Alpine and have like a development environment. Like for the person that's wanting to run like, you know, Steam or NVIDIA graphics drivers or anything like that, you know, Alpine's probably not going to be your best bet for those things. Just because the sort of activities that you do on a desktop, those are going to largely be things that require glibc if you're using Linux, uh, because the games are all compiled against glibc and all of that. So, but if what you're trying to do is develop like software appliances and that sort of thing, then having an Alpine-based desktop environment is like a development environment. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I have a, I have a box that I I mainly don't use Alpine for my desktop because of accessibility issues, because a lot of the accessibility software that I use uses binary blobs that were compiled against 2003 era glibc. Yeah. So I just x11 forward. <laughs> when I need to do something on Alpine. Yeah, no, and that's the that's the thing. You might actually have a lot of luck running those things on Alpine because there is a project called gcompat, which is a glibc compatibility layer that you can install. And it's basically like Wine, but it's for glibc instead of Windows. And basically if you install that you might actually be able to run the accessibility software, but then again, you might not be able to. It's kind of a hit or miss on what it can run. Yep. But it is a great system, and I love it. And the two Ubuntu servers that I have to use for various things will get transitioned over when they annoy me sufficiently. <laughs> And also when I could get a big enough maintenance window to do that. <laughs> That's Alpine. Anything else? 